Let's see what the stew has for us today. Welcome to the Gnomecast, Gnome Stew's tabletop gaming advice podcast. Here we talk with the other gnomes about gaming things to avoid becoming part of the stew, so I guess we'd better be good. This episode is brought to you by awesome Patreon backers like the bodacious Bill Carter, the charismatic Carla Evans, and the stupendous Scott Adams. Today we have myself, Ange, along with Chuck and Jared, and today we're going to talk about player skills and other player-focused advice. Before we dive into that main topic, though, we're going to ask our Get to Know a Gnome question. What's one time that you realized you were being that player, and what did you do to fix it? Jared, I'm going to start with you. (laughs) Well, my first thought on this one was I was going to bring up the time that I was playing a character based on uh, Randy Savage in a Pathfinder game, and I did his (laughs) voice constantly, but I'm pretty sure everybody in the game loved that, so that can't be it. Uh, (laughs) So instead, I was going to bring up my my cleric bard that I had, who was a cleric bard of Cyric, and we found a survivor of a previous adventuring company who happened to be a survivor from the adventuring company that I originally came from, and I wasn't keen on them remembering me. And I decided the best way to dispose of this NPC was when we were in a wild magic cavern. I was hoping some wild magic effect would just get rid of them. And, you know, that way I could commit manslaughter and no one could prove that it was actually me. And amazingly enough, the wild magic effects did not kill this NPC, but also were not great for the party. And I kept doing this round after round, hoping for some result that actually triggered (laughs) and did something horrible to this NPC. And at some point I did kind of realize you know what? This was funny the first couple times. I really should stop this. <laughs> so I stopped, but the nice thing is, is the next round they got carried off by a nightmare. So it all worked out in the end. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what about you, Chuck? So let me begin by saying, when am I not that player? <laughs> My entire life is just a cautionary tale of mistake after mistake after mistake and finding new and exciting ways to be obnoxious. So, um, but to my credit, I try to not be obnoxious uh, the same way in multiple games. Uh, The most recent of which was actually probably this last weekend when I was playing with uh, a friend and strangers online for Onyx PathCon. There There was a game that my friend was running. And the concern with a group of strangers is somebody really needs to get the ball rolling. And of course, me being me, I decided to get the ball rolling by being a kind of over-the-top ridiculous character. And uh, I realized pretty quickly within the game that I was sucking up a little bit too much oxygen. And so I tried to dial that back. But of course, the problem is you can't be at an 11 and then turn it down to three (laughs) without the game suffering. So it was almost this yo-yo experience of of going back and forth. But it was also my first time trying to do uh, a player voice for any extended period of time which it's important to note that doing the uh, old lady diner waitress voice for a long period of time murders your vocal cords, just so everyone knows. <laughs> you know, oddly, uh, doing Macho Man's voice for an extended period of time, not much better. <laughs> I, I believe it. Probably a very similar sort of sandpaper words experience. Oh, Yeah. Um, we ought to just have a, a podcast of everybody doing ridiculous, ridiculous character voices. So, and what about you? So I have learned of myself over the years that I have no chill. <laughs> if if I'm getting frustrated in a game, I that starts to show very quickly. And the incident I'm going to talk about, I performed the cardinal sin of backseat GMing. My friend was running a one shot of the sprawl and for some reason, like he, he he wasn't super familiar with running PBTA. He was just running it because we needed somebody to run a one shot for that session. So he would volunteered to run it. And like, because I am more familiar with PBTA I started telling him what type, you know, like, you know, this is what this role should mean. And this is what this move should mean. And it was about halfway through the game that I realized I was being really obnoxious. (laughs) And I kind of like pulled back, realized what I was doing, shut up, 
let him run the game. The rest of the game went much smoother, was much more fun. <laughs> like it wasn't PBTA. It wasn't exactly the sprawl, <laughs> but that didn't actually matter. Once I got my head out of my rear end and realized <laughs> just let, let's just play the game. He's bringing to the table. I actually love that phrase. Play the game. Your GM is bringing to the table. I think we'll probably be returning to that. Yeah. J- just a quick note in your defense, Having a player who has an excellent command of the rules, even when the GM doesn't, can be a tremendous, tremendous oh, gift yeah. to a game. Yeah, yeah, the player just needs to the player just needs to understand and we'll get into this when we get into the main you know, the main topic. It's like the player just needs to have an understanding of when and how mm-hmm. to help offer that rules mastery to the GM. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah, I know in our game last Thursday, I, I know PK knows a lot about the Sentinels game. So every so often I'd be like, I think this is the way this goes. I haven't run this yet. You know, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just kind of a touch base kind of thing. Yeah. So let's, let's get into our main topic of discussion. A lot of the advice that comes out of the RPG sphere is directed at GMs who carry the larger burden of getting a game to the table and making sure a game is successful. But there is a lot to be said for having good players at the table So we thought it'd be cool to get together and discuss some of the skills that can make a player a treasure to have at your table. I know Uh I've written articles on this. Jared, I think you have an article that will have dropped by the time this podcast is out. (laughs) And, you know, we're hoping to strong arm Chuck into writing more articles. So maybe we'll get one on him too. I'm working on it. It's not a job. (laughs) We just love your articles, Chuck. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> it, it, it takes more effort than you'd think to come up with all those fart jokes. I'm not going to lie. More fungus. More, uh, always, always the fungi. <laughs> Neat stuff going on with the uh, with the cicadas and fungus, by the way. Anyway. <laughs> Jared, why don't you... Uh... <laughs> why don't you tell us what your article is going to be about that's coming out soon? So the article that I have in the hopper right now is basically kind of looking at what your concept for your character is and more or less being an advocate for yourself, not losing track of who your character is because somebody else goes off on a tangent because you say a certain thing and someone interprets it a certain way and then they start treating your character as if you are whatever the title they can come up with because of that one thing that you did. And it is kind of about making sure that you're collaboratively thinking about the other players at the table and making sure that everyone is telling their own story and you're not overstepping and actually telling someone else's story and filling in their blanks for them. So that's a lot of what I was looking at because I've had a few characters in the past and this comes up in the article where I had a concept and in my head, I know what that character was supposed to be, but other people at the table just kind of took it and ran with it. And before I had a chance to really define that character myself, other people were reacting to things that I didn't think were true about that character. And it is a matter of kind of, you know, just having that idea in your head and making sure because nothing, nothing exists until it hits the table. So it's kind of that keeping things true in your own mind until you can express it to everyone else at the table. And I've seen this happen before where a player has a concept of their character and other players at the table get a concept of the character that's not on point. And so when they start responding to that character based on that perception, the player is confused because well, that, no, that's not my character. That's not, you know, and it's, it is a, you know, as a player, you need to be aware when your concept isn't coming across the way you wanted it to and adapt and adjust to get that concept across. Because, you know, as Chuck's first bullet point says, you got to listen to the other players. Chuck, Mm -hmm. do you want to take that and run with it? Uh, First, I'd like to say that I just had like a surreal, almost out of body experience as we were talking about that. (laughs) And I just found myself thinking over and over again, are we talking about games or are we talking about real life? (laughs) Because that's that's a microcosm of what we deal with in the the real world, Mm -hmm. too. Like, I know who I am, theoretically, possibly, (laughs) but sometimes I fail to get that across. And the same skill set that you use to better get across your intentions or your personality can be brought to the table for for a game as well. But that's true of everything with gaming. Yeah. 
I, I'd actually like to start with not my first bullet point um, because <laughs> with everything. Well, first because I can't count. It's it's a horrible it's a horrible tragedy. The, the perils of statistics. Please don't yell at me, Matt. Um, <laughs> is that uh, at least for me, my arithmetic skills have have atrophied to the point of just blackening and falling off. But uh, <laughs> the first thing I think to keep in mind is just like you said, uh, play the game the GM is bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And the corollary to that, I think, is but also bring your own stuff. And the analogy that really springs to mind is it's like a potluck. It's not that the GM is cooking a five course meal for everybody. It's that the GM is cooking an entree. And everybody else is bringing their side dishes. Right. And just like if you're having an Italian themed potluck, then, you know, hey, we all love, you know, guacamole, but maybe don't bring that to the Italian themed potluck. <laughs> and just like that, if we're playing a serious meditative game on the nature of mortality or something else really boring, you know, don't bring your, your silly clown college character. At the same time, if you have a sillier game or even any kind of superheroes game practically, Maybe don't bring your your meditative nature of mortality character to that. And I think that speaks to the larger issue of just pay attention to everybody else at the table. You know, it's not just the GM's job to entertain everybody. It's also your job to entertain mm -hmm. other players. And players that keep that in mind, that their audience is not the GM. The audience is also the other players. And really key into that, not necessarily in a performer way, but in a like human beings interacting way. I think that leads to a much, much better game. I know one of the things that, that I was trying to get across in my article that I recently wrote on this playing the game at the table is you chose to take a seat in this game. No mm -hmm. one is forcing you to be here. If they are, call 911. <laughs> but you chose to take up a seat at that table. Give the GM and the other players at the table enough trust and respect to start playing the game that they're trying to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, if the GM isn't communicating clear enough for you to understand what type of character is going to work in that setting, ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, try not to make something that's going to be completely counter to what is being discussed about the game. And try to actually, you know, like every GM is prepared for the players to go left when they expected them to go right. Mm -hmm. But please don't ignore the plot hooks. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. every, you know, the GM has spent time preparing a game for you. Whatever level of preparation that is, they've spent time preparing for you. And if you decide to purposefully ignore any of their plot hooks, because you would rather go look at muffins in a window. <laughs> the GM is going to do the best to accommodate you, but they've got all the stuff they set up for you that is now just sitting there. Maybe they'll get to use it some other time, but try not to ignore the plot hooks too much. And mm -hmm. be kind, especially to newer GMs. Mm -hmm. so it's going to take time to learn how to, to do all of this with finesse and skill. Mm-hmm. I find an excuse to go to where the story is. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the story that the GM has come up with, but don't turn it into a solo show that's all about you. And don't be deliberately re reactionary isn't the right word, not reactive. What's the word that I'm looking for here? <laughs> don't be a jerk. That's the word I'm looking for. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> you know, that's, Really, I think where we need to go with that, yeah. Yeah, it, it's the well, it's the choose to engage with the game world. Mm -hmm. Choose to engage with it because it's it's very easy to make a lone wolf character who's aloof and above it all, and the GM will bend over backwards to try and keep your character involved. Some of the other players may do their best to keep you involved, but it shouldn't be their job. Mm -hmm. You know, engage with what's there at the table. I also think beyond, this is another one of those things that happens where everything kind of turns into, you know, the GM is presenting this thing and the players have to engage or not engage. But another thing is there's all these other people at the table in most cases. Mm -hmm. And what I was going to say is beyond just not defining someone else's character for them, look for opportunities to bring someone else's character in and, not on your terms, but like if you see a character and you're wondering, like, what's your story in character, ask them what their story is. You know, mm -hmm. if they seem to care about a thing, 
ask them why they care about this thing. If they're afraid of a thing, ask them why they're afraid of this thing. Because then not only are you playing your character, but you're also giving them the opportunity to play their character and you've just framed it. Like, this is what I Mm -hmm. want to know about your character. Tell me about it. Go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually really important too, because again, that's taking, not only are you not having to tell your story on your terms all the time, constantly, or the GM needing to pay attention to everyone. It's everyone at the table collectively looking for those spaces where you can get other people to tell their story at different times. Mm -hmm. For me, the best players to have sit down at my table are the players who enthusiastically want to engage with the story of the game and who want to enthusiastically engage with the other players at the table. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, they make it easy to run because Oh my God, is it hard when you have players who don't engage? Absolutely. I mean. <laughs> put, put down the phone, please. Uh, and, and I realize that some people have social anxiety. I realize there may be a lot of reasons why people need to look at their phone. But at the same time, I, I play games with a doctor who has to get like emergency calls and yeah. he's not on his phone all the time. If you are enthusiastic and engaged, I can put up with, pretty much anything that isn't outright abusive to other people at the table or not, as long as you're engaged and enthusiastic. Anything else I can uh, I've been getting... It's June. Facebook Memories is full of origins right now. Mm -hmm. It's making me very, very sad. But I also had show up a table selfie from a game I ran in, I want to say, 2018, that was the worst game I have ever run at a con <laughs> because I had six players who were completely not proactive. Like not a single one of them would in like I had to drag them through the story. Like I'm like, here's the setup. What do you do? And like, it was just so hard because none of them would engage with me as an NPC or each other as PCs or, and like, I couldn't get them to actively choose to do anything. Literally, it was a a reverse heist. They had to figure out who stole something and go get it back. Oh, that's cute setup. I'm going to steal that like (laughs) next week. I hope that's okay. Totally okay. Yeah. So the the other times I've run it, The players usually spend about the first 45 minutes to an hour investigating the vault that was broken into. These players spent two and a half hours. I couldn't get them to leave the vault. I literally (laughs) had to take a break at the two hour point. And I said, when we come back, you're telling me where you're going next. Mm -hmm. And we got back and they dragged out questions about the vault for another half an hour. And I'm just like, no, we're done here. Where are you going? I think sometimes that's even, I think that's that's a trust issue at times too. And mm-hmm. it's people so afraid that someone is going to punish them for missing something that mm-hmm. they're afraid to formulate things. And it's like, when I'm framing the scene, I am giving you toys to play with. There's no right or wrong thing to seize on in this scene. Just grab something and run with it. We just need some texture to tell the story with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I feel like I need to defend a certain school of player in this case, though. Like, there, there, there's a whole spectrum of players. On the one hand, you have ones that basically want to choose your own adventure. They want you to mm-hmm. set, use flowery language, set things up, let them imagine, yeah. and then tell them, then ask them, do you go left or do you go right? Turn to page 98 if you go left. <laughs> and those are at one extreme, and, and, those might be fun to play with. I, I don't have a lot of those players. On the other hand, you have the players that you can just sort of let them loose and they're going to spend an hour and a half in the muffin shop. And that can also be fun for them, maybe not for you as a GM unless you're prepared to roll with that. But I think the key is to, to establish expectations. And mm-hmm. when things veer off those expectations, to, to even just say with the authority of the GM, there is nothing left for you to find in this vault. And that's not to say that's what you should have done. I'm sure there were all kinds of other contextual things. Yeah. That's just what I probably would have done in that circumstance. Like, Usually, usually as a GM, I see a mix of players at the table. I usually mm-hmm. have one or two proactive people, yeah. a couple of passive people, and a couple of people in between. This just happened to be a table full of passive people. 
Yeah. <sighs> like I didn't even have <laughs> one proactive person to latch onto. Like the, oh, that's finally rough. at like the three hour mark, one of the players finally did something proactive and I'm like, Oh my God, thank God. Okay. Let's get going. Mm-hmm. You know, and like grabbed onto that and pushed them along further using that. I'm mm-hmm. just kind of laughing because we started off talking about players and we still bring it back around to when we're yeah, GMing. Yeah. And <laughs> it's so hard not to. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it is really hard not to because it's a lot of the GM's job is managing the table, managing the players at the table. And, you know, if you are a player at the table, and you see that you have some passive people or some people who aren't as, you know, comfortable with things, you can help out the GM a lot by interacting with that player, interacting with their character and helping pull them along on the adventure. One of the odd things I noticed as a GM was a lot of times I would get very quiet new players at the table who I didn't think were having a very good time because they weren't doing much mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then at the end of the game they would thank me for a fantastic time <laughs> Aww. and a lot of what it was is like they didn't necessarily know how to get involved but making sure i still went back to them every time was good so as a player i definitely try and like okay who's being too shy who's being <laughs> too withdrawn and making sure to pull their character along with my shenanigans and and to Jared's point, that is something that other play and, and the point that you made as well, that is something that you as a player can do. And again, to return to Jared's point, while still keeping it true to their character, not everybody's comfortable talking in character. Mm. Not everybody wants to do a goofy character voice. Not any not everybody wants to even talk in character. And that's fine. You can still present actions that the characters do together or parts of their history. But I would say that those things probably need to be framed as questions rather than as statements of fact. Mm-hmm. Like hey, is it okay with you if our characters played baseball together when they were kids? Mm-hmm. And I was terrible at baseball. How were you at it? You know, that kind of thing. And, and yeah. you know, one of the things that I like doing from the player side is, and this is something Ange might remember, like, I like finding a reason why my character isn't just associates with other people in the group, but is friends with somebody else in the group. Mm-hmm. Because then you can start having those kind of in jokes and those like, remember that time we did this and all of that. And that starts working. But the important thing with that is, is to then widen it out to the other direction. So like with Angie's character, our characters were friends and we would joke about, you know, her being impatient and throwing fireballs. But this then, is a now problem. <laughs> yes, this is a now problem. This is not a later problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it also helped like you know once you know zudrok the goblin ranger started riding on my shoulders that gave me an end to start making comments to zudrok because i was the big tall furbolg and the the goblin ranger used me as his firing platform so then you know now i have a tie to two different people in the group and you know mm-hmm. you just keep building like that mm-hmm. yeah it's like stay you know involved and invested in the game at the table mm-hmm be the other player's biggest fans. That's yes. that's yes. really key. Yep. A lot of PBTA games will mention be a fan of the players, but that is GM focused advice. And I think that's actually a good mindset for everyone at the table. Like be a fan of the group, be a fan of mm-hmm. how we are telling the story together. Yep. Yeah. It, it's like as a GM, we try and move the spotlight around the table as a player, you should be happy to see other players get the spotlight too. Mm-hmm. And and shine it on them. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier in, in the episode, we, we mentioned if you are a rules expert of the game at which you are a player, how best to handle being a support for the GM. I will say that I have many, many times relied on players that are far smarter about the rules than I am to help mm-hmm. me run a game. It's just, you have to, you know, don't be a rules lawyer. You know, don't mm-hmm. argue with the GM about a call. That's probably the, the biggest key <laughs> right there. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly think this is, this is a, a big thing in a lot of aspects of life. But I think when you're talking about how best to do this, I think it's always good just in, in any kind of interpersonal dynamic is having consent. Like, you mm-hmm. know, if you say, hey, I ran across this one rule. Do you mind if I bring it up? 
mm-hmm. then it it's not like you're trying to you know railroad you know things your direction or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like wait 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 till the GM asks you for advice. Mm-hmm. You know, asks you the question. Hey, how does this rule actually work? Um, you know, I I I don't want to disagree entirely with that, but so I am. Um, not somebody who loves rules. I love games with rules. I don't like mastering the rules. Uh, I like playing with people who have done that work for me. And I, I really like it when they volunteer information, even when I don't ask, because they have that kind of command. I think the key is you shouldn't be arguing in your game. Exactly. If at any point in time, real feelings of real arguments are coming up, that's time to take a time out and figure out what's going on. And maybe you have a player that just thinks that that's how gaming goes. Lots of players have that, but mm-hmm. it, it at no point in time, I think, should should voices actually be raised in an RPG game. You know, to to another point that uh, you were saying, it's like you can, as an as a player who knows the rules really well, you can help the other players understand their characters and what they can mm-hmm. do. You mm-hmm. know, because let's face it, everyone has varying levels of amount of time and energy they can put into the game. Mm -hmm. I have a player who, you know, I love playing with her, but she doesn't have time to sit down and make the character. She just, she wants to come to the table, have a character she understands the concept of and role play it. And then if she needs to roll something, she can ask for advice on what to Mm -hmm. roll. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, I have no problem helping her put a character together for a game that we're both going to be players in or, Mm -hmm. you know, offering advice on, you know, how to play, you know, the different mechanical things that she can do beyond the playing of her character as, you know, role-playing, if that makes sense. I I will say pick a lane and stay in it unless you deliberately want to change those lanes, because I I have also had those players and have sometimes been that player where that's all I want or that's all that they Mm -hmm. want, but nothing brings a game to a grinding halt quite like a person who is completely disinterested in the rules of the game until it's their turn. Mm, yeah. And then they want to know all the ins and outs. And please don't do that. Please, 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 please. The game exists on times when it's not your turn. You can do all kinds of stuff with that time. And yeah. it's perfectly okay if you don't know the best optimal thing to do as long as you do something. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But also, uh, backseat players, if a person does a, sub-op- a suboptimal thing and they're having fun, let them do it. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, yes. Don't <laughs> don't tell other people how to play their characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's like that's like bad player number 1 or <laughs> maybe number 2, but it's it's bad player on the list. Yeah, it, advice, yes, order, no. I uh, I played a game at Origins uh, in 2019, the last time I was there, <laughs> um, but I played a game and because of various reasons, me and another player who happened to also be female got a bunch of extra bennies for our characters. And it was basically just to represent like an out of game benefit we had gotten for that group, mm-hmm. which is like, you know, like nobody seemed to have a problem with that in and of itself. But we had two players who started getting really obnoxious when we wouldn't use those bennies the way he thought we should. Mm -hmm. And it was to the point where he started just rolling his eyes about like, well, you have all those bennies there. You could totally be doing this. And it was it was very much in that rules lawyery. I'm going to tell you how to play your character type of vibe. And it was just like, no, that's I don't have any interest in doing what you're telling me to do especially because the way you're telling me to do it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had um, my character that I mentioned in the article, one of the characters that I mentioned was a werewolf character. And I built him so that he could talk to the uh, spirits of the deceased. And I didn't use this ability for a while. And we had some players that were just assuming like, why do you have this ability and you're not using it? And, you know, once somebody finally asked me, it's like, well, because his wife died and he's afraid he's going to see her. Like, I, that was, you know, then he would have to deal with the fact that she is gone. She has moved on. And that's why he never wanted to use that ability. But everyone was so used to, like, you know, kind of treating him as a, he's the goofball. It's like he's the goofball because he gave up everything in his regular life because she died and it just shattered yeah. him. So it was kind of nice to actually kind of whip that one out when it's like, you're playing this suboptimally. Actually, yes, I am. <laughs> and this is why. Mm-hmm. 
and and the ability to drop that at a at a dramatically appropriate time just had to be fun. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I'm not big on keeping secrets from other players, but this was almost sort of like you never actually gave me the chance. I would have told you this up front, but you know, mm-hmm. you know, it just hasn't come up yet. And that, that's probably actually another good piece of advice for players. It's great to have cool hidden things in your background, but they don't matter unless they come out at the table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and don't be mad if that's not the thing that everybody else wants to explore at the moment. Mm-hmm. Even if both you and the GM think it's the coolest thing ever, and it happens, sometimes that's just not where the group goes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it, it's great to have those things in there, but... Don't get mad if nobody's interested in it and don't be mad if like it never comes out Mm because you have to help it come out. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. I was going to say, there's lots of television shows where they drop this momentous thing and it just doesn't seem to have the impact that the framing in the the episode seems (laughs) to make it have. And then you notice in a few episodes, they just don't mention it anymore. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It just might not have been that important. I was going to say when it comes to like relating to players and there's some media that just popped into my head where it's like, if you want to watch this, this is a good example of this. When we're talking about players getting defined by other people, if you watch all the seasons of She-Ra, my favorite character on there was Entrapta. And there is Mm -hmm. a point at which everyone in the series assumes that she is flighty and that she doesn't realize the importance of the situation. And she explains her thought process in that final season. And I love that so much. And it is one of those cases where people just kind of assumed certain things about her because they never asked her why she was doing things in a certain manner. And I absolutely love that so much. So watch Entrapta and because she's great and she's the best character on there. I, 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 will, fight. <laughs> I, I, I will fight for Catra's honor. Okay, I mean, yeah. I mean, Catra is a dumpster fire, but that's why I love her. <laughs> Make better decisions, Catra. <laughs> oh, yep. <sighs> Chuck and I clearly have to be in a, a Shira game at some point in time. Together. Are, is somebody running a Shira game? Is that an option? I am there. I am already in my car and driving. And somewhere, I feel like Senda is now looking over my shoulder, going, "What?" <laughs> Look, look, if you need somebody to play your hot mess of an ex, I have got that character down. <laughs> oh, goodness. I think on that note, we've probably, you know, we probably hit the point where we should, like, are there any last words you have? I mean, there's going to be more articles that we write in the future about advice to players. You know, I've got a few of them I want to do. But, like, any last words of advice for players? Pay attention to the other players and be their biggest fan. Yeah, I think um, that's uh, that's one of the biggest things. I've always thought that role-playing games are a great tool for teaching empathy. And it mm-hmm. shouldn't just be between like the DM and one person at a time. It should be between all the people that are engaging in that game. Mm-hmm. Yep, I think those yep. are two very good points. Excellent. So this show is funded by the Gnome Stew Patreon. You two can become a Patreon backer by following the Patreon link on the Gnome Stew website to the Gnome Stew Patreon. This ad is brought to you by The Clone Machine. Got a great player and wish you had more of them? Just get them to walk through The Clone Machine and soon you'll have dozens of them and make your game even better. Please be mindful that we do not guarantee success of copies of copies and results may vary depending upon the source material. Still love wrong for that. <laughs> <laughs> if you are enjoying the Gnome Cash, you'll probably like many of the other Mr. Actor Mark shows. Here's one to check out. They're a super geek. They're a Super Geek is an actual play one-shot live stream created by three Black, Indigenous, multiracial, or people of color players to highlight the voices of marginalized folks in the tabletop RPG scene. They feature gender-marginalized GMs and a diverse, rotating cast of players. Tune in every other Thursday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time on the Misdirected Mark Twitch. That one is just getting started, so definitely tune in. You can find all of us at GnomeStew.com, at GnomeStew on Twitter, and GnomeStew on Facebook. Gnomes, where else can we find you on the internet? Chuck, go. Uh, you can find my writing at gnomestew.com. I'm pretty much a ghost <laughs> everywhere else at this point because other stuff is going on. There's, and where can know, we see you? World. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> you can find me at Twitter and Instagram as orikes13, O-R-I-K-E-S 13. 
Twitter is mostly quiet. I've posted a little bit recently, but mostly quiet. Instagram is a lot of pictures of cats. That's what the internet is for. It's yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, what about you? All right. You can find my other blog where I write things at what do I know jr.com. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at what do I know jr. And you can find the text to speech version of my blog posts at anchor.fm slash what do I know audio blog. Awesome. So, do you think we were good enough players that we avoided the stew this time? Yeah, nobody brought up Batman. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wait, we were supposed to bring up Batman? Nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Batman. Because, man, do I have thoughts. <laughs> Gnomecast is hosted by Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Okay, we're going to start over again. The magic of audio. (laughs) Welcome to the Gnomecat. (laughs) Sorry, sorry.